So uh, it's a pleasure to be to be here for the second time, as you said, uh, Mr. Flasher. And uh, my memory is that uh, he appreciated enormously the spontaneity and the, the I would say, liv liveliness of the uh, discussion in particular. So uh, let me uh, mention that normally you should have been given two documents, uh, which are uh, of a different nature. One is um, a work which has been done by the G30, which I chair, uh, and um, is, uh, I would say, gathering a number of uh, persons uh, coming from various origins, but with a lot of central bankers. And uh, I thought that it would be good that we would reflect together with uh, central bank uh, uh, responsible persons, or previous central banks responsible uh, uh, authorities, um, uh, on this very, very important issue, which is what uh, happened exactly uh, in the crisis, uh, what, uh, wh what were the reasons uh, why we were in a crisis, uh, uh, did we have, uh, or do we still have fundamentals in central banking that are extremely important and that we should not forget? Uh, do we have new concepts that have emerged in the crisis and uh, are uh, um, sustainable and are, are here to stay? And uh, I think it was very interesting because it was not concentrating on any particular central bank or any particular economy, but on the issue of central banking itself at the global level, uh, I would say at the light of, uh, of the crisis. And there is a second document which uh, uh, I uh, published myself uh, in 14, and where I uh, am uh, explaining what I think are provisional lessons drawn from the crisis. I would say de facto, not de jure, uh, not because we, we had uh, an overall uh, way of uh, organizing ourselves, uh, our own future policies, but because in the crisis, with the uh, pressure of the crisis, a number of central banks in the advanced economy had converged quite considerably and uh, had uh, uh, decided, uh, again spontaneously, without uh, previous consultation, that they would have some kind of rapprochement between uh, their uh, various concepts. And it was uh, striking for me, reflecting after having uh, uh, left my uh, own position in 11, I was I had a little time to reflect on what had happened. And I was uh, very, very impressed by the fact that uh, obviously uh, a number of, uh, of uh, dimensions of the convergence between the various uh, central banks in the advanced economy had to be noted. Uh, I did not produce any particular paper on what happened in Europe. And of course, my own experience is much more concentrating uh, uh, when I look at uh, all what I've been doing on, on Europe itself. And after all, uh, it's, uh, uh, you are yourself uh, uh, working in the context of a European uh, university and uh, with the European concept uh, uh, of uh, uh, masters. So uh, maybe it's uh, not negligible for me to say just a few words on uh, the uh, European um, uh, experience uh, in order to, to start a little bit very rapidly. And then I would like to concentrate on this conceptual convergence I have already mentioned and the various dimensions of this conceptual convergence as the first part, if I may, of my exposition. And then I would like to concentrate on the open questions as I see them uh, in, uh, in the present uh, situation. It seems to me that there are a number of things that have to be said now, a number of, uh, of um, uh, I would say, dimensions in the uh, working of the central banks that are perhaps uh, not sufficiently stressed or ignored uh, or uh, are still posing a lot of, uh, of uh, questions that are not yet answered. And I will conclude on, uh, on future uh, consideration. So a word on, on Europe, only to tell you that my own understanding of the uh, European uh, 
so-called European crisis is that it was the third episode of the global crisis of the advanced economies. I uh, take it that uh, what happened in uh, 2007 with the subprime and then uh, in 2008 with the uh, uh, Lehman Brothers collapse and all what uh, it triggered were the two first episodes of the global crisis of the advanced economy. In those two first episodes, uh, the epicenter of the global crisis of the advanced economy was in the United States of America, subprime, Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers coming after Burstern, after uh, uh, and, and before perhaps uh, AIG, uh, City, and so forth. So you had uh, the epicenter of the crisis at the moment where the crisis was a crisis of the private financial signatures, the, again, the worst financial signatures, private financial signatures in the world were located in the United States of America. It doesn't mean that it was a global, uh, uh, only a US crisis, it was a global crisis, and we were touched quasi-immediately, both by the uh, subprime crisis or by the Lehman Brothers crisis. But uh, it is clear that we were in a situation where uh, a particular economy had uh, the, I would say, important responsibility of being the epicenter with uh, the particular responsibility which goes with that. Then the crisis morphed from a crisis of the private financial signature to a crisis of the public financial signature, to the a, a, a crisis of the sovereign risk, a crisis of the signature of the nations themselves, amongst, still amongst the advanced economy. And uh, uh, in my own reading of what has happened, the um, uh, equivalent of Burr Stern, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in the US, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Citicorp, was in this third episode of the crisis, uh, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, you name it. You see, we, we had the equivalent in terms of sequence of signature, considered very bad signature, non-reliable signature, the very same systemic nature of the crisis, because you see, it was not the crisis of one particular signature. It was the crisis of the full Wall Street uh, with a sequence of signature, but signaling the systemic aspect of it. And it was the same in Europe. The great difference, of course, is that uh, when in the uh, first, the two, the f first and second episode, uh, and only for you to have a particular moment in, in your mind for the, these episodes. The first episode the, uh, of the, uh, I would say, subprime crisis uh, be became very apparent uh, in August 2007. The, f the f end of that first episode in this reading and the beginning of the second was the 15th of September 2008. That was the bankruptcy of uh, Lehman Brothers. And uh, the third episode started, and the second episode uh, ended, um, the, the third episode started with the uh, open uh, crisis in Greece, which you can you know, say was end of uh, 2009, beginning 2010. And we are still in an episode which, where you can say that uh, the uh, uh, European, the Euro area in particular, remains in the epicenter of that crisis. Uh, there is no other epicenter uh, at the moment, but of course uh, the uh, crisis has been very largely surmounted and uh, nobody in the rest of the world is considering that we have still an open crisis of the sovereign risk of the advanced economy. That being said, I don't think that we, one could argue that uh, we are out of the crisis. We are still in the crisis. And you will see that we have a number of uh, dimensions 
that we can observe today, which are probably signaling that we are still in uh, the crisis. Uh, one very rapid listing of uh, the reason why the advanced economy put themselves in such an abominable crisis. <coughs> I am myself listing in my paper of uh, 2014 a number of uh, reasons uh, why uh, the advanced economy were in this extraordinary clumsy situation which um, made them uh, in the uh, uh, eyes of the entire world, including the entire emerging world, uh, in this very clumsy situation of uh, having totally disrupted uh, markets and uh, economies. Uh, I uh, listed this, uh, these reasons. One could uh, argue differently, and uh, of course uh, it doesn't, I don't pretend that it would be exhaustive, but we certainly had the, uh, a phenomenon which is uh, very, very uh, uh, impressive uh, and uh, is the uh, uh, fact that uh, we had an incredible sophistication of the financial instruments, uh, generalization of the securitization of shadow banking, uh, generalization of uh, derivative markets of all kinds, uh, uh, emergence uh, of uh, an industry which did not exist only 30 years ago, uh, which was the highly leveraged uh, institutions, uh, financial institutions industry, the hedge funds industry, which uh, I could see under my own eyes, uh, you know, growing and growing and growing quite impressively, but this is an example. And uh, so we, we had the, I would say, biological evolution of the financial markets with, uh, uh, and in particular, of course, under the pressure of uh, the IT revolution, uh, we had a fantastic uh, sophistication of these uh, financial markets, which make them more and more difficult to decipher. A second dimension is also linked to uh, the, uh, I would say, IT revolution, and it is the increase of uh, interconnectedness, uh, which was made possible by the IT revolution, but was also triggered by the phenomenon of globalization, by the conversion of uh, practically all economies of the world to market economies or to economies that, where the market would play an important role, economies that would accept to join themselves in the global trade and uh, global markets. And of course, this uh, created a new, a new world, uh, largely unknown previously, world where all institutions, economic and financial, all markets, all, uh, I would say, economies were very closely interconnected and uh, creating uh, what I see personally as uh, both phenomenon, the first and the second phenomenon, were creating something like a new universe. Uh, we, uh, the analogy with physics uh, might be uh, interesting. You know, we, we were in uh, a, a new world, a new adaptive world, uh, which uh, has uh, had new and still has new properties, that uh, the emerging properties that are not really fully explored. And we could see the explosion of part of these new properties with the crisis of Lehman Brothers and with the uh, phenomenon of contagion, which was unseen before. Now, another dimension which has also listed in this paper is the excess of leverage. Uh, under all that period, we could see a, a formidable excess of leverage, a piling up of debt, public and private, in the advanced economy also, by the way, in the global economy as a whole and in uh, some emerging economies. This, uh, I would say, piling up of debt was curiously neglected, uh, largely neglected by the international community over many, many years before the crisis. Uh, and uh, this phenomenon is curious because uh, we had already had a lot of very uh, interesting work done by economists on the dangers of such situation. We had the uh, Irving Fisher uh, 
uh, analysis of uh, what had happened in the uh, crisis of the 2930s. Uh, uh, in the 20th century, we had uh, a lot of uh, very good work done by uh, Hyman Minsky, and particularly uh, the Minsky moment where uh, you have uh, you know, the uh, total reversal of uh, <coughs> the uh, piling up of debt and the uh, confidence uh, building, uh, self, uh, self confidence building exercise, which turns out to be uh, a drama. And uh, we, uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, the occasion of rediscovering all this in the occasion of the crisis. But what remains very, very surprising and uh, hard to believe is that uh, during all that period, the danger of uh, what we were uh, piling up uh, in terms of uh, potential for crisis was uh, very largely neglected. And one of the explanations we have was that the economists on the one hand, the central banks on the other hand, a lot of responsible entities, including uh, uh, governments, uh, say the mainstream of the analysis was that we had more or less discovered in the years uh, starting from, uh, say, the beginning of the uh, 90s up to the explosion of the crisis, uh, we had discovered the appropriate way of dealing with uh, economics and uh, with the real economy as well as with uh, the uh, monetary economy, the inflation, we had found the appropriate way of uh, uh, working out both, I would say, steady growth and low inflation with a very low volatility, both for growth and for inflation, uh, during a long period of time. Uh, this great moderation, it was the name which was given to this period. Uh, I said uh, beginning of the 90s, I should say uh, mid, mid 80s up to uh, mid 2000s. So a period of 20 years with um, a lot of complacency, a lot of, compl a lot of intellectual complacency and a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, executive complacency by all those who had responsibility. I would not put necessarily the central banks and the central bankers at the heart of this complacency because uh, uh, you could certainly find out a lot of central bankers warning because it is after all their own job, you know, that uh, uh, we had to be very careful, that complacency would be a terrible mistake and so forth. And you could find out some central banks and central bankers that were permanently accused of being too orthodox. And I, I am part of this constituency of central bankers, which were constantly accused of being too orthodox, uh, too, I would say, prudent, too cautious. We, which, uh, you know, tells us a lot on the way uh, uh, central banking was considered by the mainstream again at, at that time. But uh, let's put the central bankers aside. It's clear that it was a phenomenon that was very, very largely shared. And uh, all the, uh, I would say, warnings that you could give, both in warning the private sector that the piling up of debt indefinitely was a recipe for catastrophe, although all the warnings uh, on the fact uh, that uh, binding up government debt uh, permanently was also a recipe for catastrophe. These warnings were very largely ignored. And there were this complacency in the central banking constituency that after all, there was inflation which was very well in order after a terrible period of very high inflation, the hard work being done in the 80s proved to be uh, successful and the central bankers had the feeling that after all they were doing what the uh, I would say uh, uh, external uh, partners would uh, expect from them namely to deliver price stability in an appropriate way without uh, uh, any uh, I would say uh, 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 high cost to be paid in terms of growth. 
Uh, last reason I am giving, of course, as you see, all those reasons are uh, closely interconnected. The uh, last reasons I am giving is that uh, there was, you know, covering all those four first reasons, the overall sentiment, which was also uh, demonstrating a very great deal of complacency, that the efficiency of markets, of financial markets, in almost all circumstances, was warranted, um, and that you know, uh, uh, very good economic research was demonstrating that uh, markets were efficient. Uh, not absolutely all economists were on that side, but uh, a very large, an overwhelming majority of economists were on that line, and uh, of course that would. Uh, legitimate uh, not only the complacency I already mentioned, but also all the deregulation exercise that took place and uh, uh, during this, uh, this period, uh, starting say in the, uh, particularly in the last part of the uh, 90s and going on and on and on. And uh, this, uh, this phenomenon of, um, of large deregulation, of course, was multiplying all the other dimensions because it was, of course, uh, multiplying the way the various markets were interconnected and the various institutions were interconnected. It was multiplying the sophistication of uh, financial instruments uh, uh, and uh, the uh, very, very great difficulty to decipher exactly what was behind. Uh, it was also, of course, uh, uh, a good way to uh, facilitate the credit dynamics, both private and public. So, you see a, a lot of, uh, of dimension that can explain why we were put in this absolutely incredible situation in the 15th of September 2008 where we uh, could see that the advanced economy as a whole were about to collapse. And uh, this uh, was something which I experienced myself. I was uh, president of the ECB and uh, we really could see uh, one of the emerging property of this new financial sphere and real economy sphere that I have already mentioned namely that the, uh, a, a single event happening uh, in a single marketplace, namely Lehman Brothers in Wall Street, with a, a particular, I would say, characteristics of being a medium-sized entity, could trigger quasi-immediately the uh, dramatic change of sentiment uh, not only in that particular country, namely the US, but also in all advanced economies, and by way of consequence, of, co uh, of course, also in the rest of the world. And uh, that particular event uh, was uh, exerting <coughs> its contagious influence in a matter, as a matter of half days. And that, of course, as I already said, was something which was unseen. We had seen bankruptcies in the 29th, 30s that had an influence over time <coughs> and across economies and across continents. Uh, but that, of course, was taking months or quarters the idea that we could live in a world where uh, we could have absolutely dramatic change <coughs> of overall behavior of an overwhelming majority of uh, decision makers, entities, uh, responsible authorities and so forth <coughs> in such a short span of time was something which was entirely new. And <coughs> for us uh, central bankers, it was uh, one of these extraordinary challenges that you have to accept uh, uh, challenges of uh, responsible authorities in exceptional times. But to give you also, uh, to illustrate the fact that it was something rather extraordinary, <coughs> the 
rhetoric that uh, was uh, the terms of reference of the uh, Treasury of the United States of America, which was at the heart, of course, of this uh, crisis, was that uh, we were, uh, they were, <coughs> in a market economy, that in a market economy, it is absolutely normal that from time to time, you have uh, dramatic events of that kind, that the only difference between Soviet Union on the one hand and the market economy on the other hand was that you had no bankruptcy in Soviet Union, which was true, and that you had bankruptcy in market economy, which was equally true, so that it was absolutely normal that a very poorly managed institution uh, which uh, was uh, the worst managed institution you could imagine in the uh, economy of uh, the financial economy of a particular country, which was the United States of America, was nothing to be worrying about. And that rhetoric was obviously quite explainable, uh, was the terms of reference, as I said, during, say, two days, two days and a half. Uh, of course, it could not last too long because the entire financial sector of the advanced economy was collapsing, was starting to collapse. Uh, and uh, uh, the central banks could see that, the Fed, of course, the first was a f to, to see that, but also uh, all the other central banks of the advanced economies. And uh, to, to show you the rapidity of uh, all those phenomena, we were working on, it was a Monday morning that the bankruptcy of uh, Lehman Brothers was announced, the 15th of September, Monday morning. So we worked on a collective response to this phenomenon as soon as Monday afternoon. And then we continued to work on Tuesday and Wednesday. When I say we, we the United States, we the Euro area, uh, the, the ECB Central Bank, we uh, in London, the Bank of England, we in Japan, Bank of Japan, and a number of other central banks that were associated with this uh, meditation in the advanced economy because the crisis was hitting the advanced economy. We were rapid enough to work out a first response with first terms of reference which could be signed by all central banks of the uh, advanced economy that I have mentioned. And uh, we published uh, this uh, decision, collective decision, and uh, these terms of reference to show the entire world that uh, we were aware of the gravity of the situation and we were taking collectively together in uh, uh, an expression of unity and of a consultation that uh, was absolutely new and uh, unseen, equally unseen, and we could publish that as soon as uh, Thursday. Thursday morning we published, and you see the small span of time that we had, not only to work out the response, which was the activation of a large network of swaps permitting to deliver uh, liquidity to all uh, those entities that would need liquidity at the, at the time uh, with the, the collateral being expressed, the, the guarantee for uh, getting the liquidity being expressed in the local currency. So you could have all the currencies uh, denomination that you would need. By the, as a matter of fact, what was badly needed at the time was the US dollar liquidity. And uh, so you could have US dollar liquidity in presenting uh, guarantees, not in US dollar, but in euros, in yen, in sterling, and so forth. <coughs> so as you see, uh, uh, something uh, absolutely extraordinary was happening. And it is on these uh, rather extraordinary uh, lessons that we can draw from what the central bank we, we are doing that I would like to concentrate a little bit now. As I promised, I would like to uh, concentrate on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, what I call the conceptual convergence. Uh, and uh, you, as you can see, uh, this is something that I am uh, mentioning in one of the papers you had uh, to, to prepare for this uh, lecture. Uh, 
But uh, let's concentrate on conceptual convergence. I have listed myself something like nine dimensions of what I call conceptual convergence. And again, as I already said, this is an observation that I am making myself that when you compare the position of the various central banks of the advanced economy, and I'm a little bit concentrating on the largest advanced economy to have uh, uh, something like a sample that would be uh, representative and, and credible. When I look at what they have been doing, the way they have moved, the new decisions taken, the new reference, the new conceptual reference they have, again, I see uh, that large number of dimension of uh, the uh, so-called convergence. So I will list that quite rapidly, otherwise I will uh, outpass the time that you generously gave me. And <coughs> so I know that, of course, we have also the con the, the uh, dialogue that uh, will engage and uh, the uh, uh, way, uh, the response which will be made by two of you, I think, and it's, uh, it's been very well prepared. So, as regards monetary policy, I would say that there, is, there was a lot of dispute on whether or not it was useful to look at the dynamics of credit, to look at uh, the uh, overall, I would say, monetary aggregates their components and their counterparts. Of course, one of the major counterparts of the monetary aggregate being the, the credit to the economy. We were strongly divided before the crisis, very strongly divided. And I have to say that even the ECB was a little bit ridiculed by a large majority of economists considering that our reference to the monetary analysis, and not only to the economic analysis, was a little bit rear guard. It was the trace of the old Bundesbank uh, uh, mania, and all, I have to say also of the old Banque de France mania, because we always referred ourselves also to the monetary aggregates and to the component, crucially to the components of monetary aggregates. And again, as I already said, uh, amongst the component, the uh, credit to the economy is very, very important. Now, this is over. Nobody is disputing that it is always important for a central bank to look carefully at the dynamics of credit. So I see that you know, as an important dimension of what I call convergence. A second element of convergence, which is absolutely obvious, of course, is that we had in all advanced economy central banks, the use not only of the traditional conventional tools that, is, that are the, uh, mainly the interest rates, but also the uh, use of new non-conventional, unconventional measures uh, like uh, purchase of uh, treasuries, purchase of uh, private, uh, privately uh, tradable securities, uh, uh, purchase of uh, covered bonds and so forth. And also, and I mentioned that en passant, I will come back to that, not only on balance sheet uh, commitments uh, and action of central banks, namely purchase of uh, tradable securities, but also, and this is also very important, uh, uh, non uh, off balance sheet uh, commitments, uh, like uh, uh, commitment to uh, provide liquidity without any limit uh, at fixed rate, if need be, like the OMT, which is one of the action that the Central Bank of Europe took on top of the SMP, which was effective, real purchase of treasuries and tradable securities. We had also the OMT, which was the promise to intervene if and when necessary, which is an off-balance sheet commitment, which I, I put in the category of the non-conventional measures. So all central banks practice non-conventional measures. Before the crisis, it would have been considered by a large majority of central banks, I would say apart from Japan, uh, 
uh, which had already the use of such non-conventional measures, it was considered by practically all others are so, as something which is unthinkable, which would, would be unthinkable to have generalized uh, unconventional measures, quantitative measures or off-balance sheet measures of that kind. A third dimension as regards monetary policy of the uh, overall convergence uh, was the forward guidance, you know, the idea of not only taking decision at a certain moment, expressing uh, the decision taken and uh, mentioning uh, the reason why you took those decisions, but also the anticipation made by the central banks of future decisions with a degree of commitment to respect those commitments, whatever happens, whatever other decision would be taken. This mo uh, it has moved, it has, uh, it has changed over time, but forward guidance was adopted by all the central banks of the advanced economy, all the central banks that have been mentioning, even if, again, the concept has moved a little bit <coughs> from the original pure concept to uh, what uh, has been finally practical, <coughs> practiced by all, which is less unconditional than it was supposed to be at the very beginning. Nevertheless, third dimension of convergence. As regards communication of the central banks, I see also a number of uh, <coughs> uh, dimension of convergence. First, um, and I'm, I would continue to list the number, so fourth dimension of convergence, the generalization of the real-time communication concept with the generalization of press conferences. Before the crisis, we were profoundly divided in this respect. You had central banks that uh, were uh, used to have press conference, and the ECB was one of these uh, uh, central banks, so I had myself 11 press conferences every year, uh, because after each meeting of the governing council, we were uh, convinced that it was absolutely necessary to explain what, what, the, had, what had been decided, to be ready to give all possible explanation to market participants, journalists, uh, investors and savers. And uh, other central banks were considering that it was not appropriate at all. So they would only say we increase rates or we decrease rates. And then long, a long time afterwards, they would publish uh, the meditation of the open market committee meeting, of the uh, monetary policy meeting and so forth. Say 15 days afterwards or something like that. Uh, one can understand why it was absolutely necessary for the European Central Bank to have this immediate real-time communication. The idea was uh, <coughs> we are issuing the currency for a large number of countries. If we do not, uh, I would say, be as open and transparent as possible in explaining what we are doing, we are taking the great risk that explanation will be given erratically by uh, a number of, uh, uh, of uh, voices, uh, very nice voices, by the way, and very credible voices, but in different languages, translated in other languages, everything being more or less translated in English to be communicated to uh, Asia or to the US or to the rest of the world. And then, of course, cacophony, the most abominable cacophony would be the most likely uh, thing because you, you would have many, many uh, uh, voices uh, translated in many languages and uh, you could imagine what, what it would be. So the idea that the president would immediately after the decision of the governing council explain in detail what was the decision of the governing council in order for communication to be well established in a multi-nation, multi-languages entity was something which was uh, absolutely natural. But not natural at all, as I said, in the other central banks of the advanced economy. A lesson of the crisis has been that in the crisis, the need for transparency, the need for immediate communication, 
the need for immediate understanding of what was exactly happening in the central bank as a, one of the major, uh, I would say, authority in this time of uh, turbulences appear to be obvious everywhere. And uh, uh, that is the reason, in my understanding, why we had this convergence towards immediate, real-time uh, communication, particularly uh, through uh, press conferences. A second element of convergence, I have to say also, because in the first case, you see, it is more or less the other central banks joining what we were already doing ourselves for very good reasons. Uh, both, uh, we were the first for very good reasons, and they joined for very good reasons. Uh, then we ourselves uh, changed uh, uh, more or less our own way of looking at it. We considered that it was not appropriate to publish a detailed uh, compte rendu, a detailed uh, minute of uh, the discussion in the uh, uh, governing council, because we considered that uh, we had already done the job with the immediate publication of a summing up of our position and with the press conferences. So introductory remarks plus the response to questions was our way of explaining what we were doing. And we, we, we saw at the very beginning a certain contradiction in doing that and then again, 15 days later, to publish something which would necessarily would have been a little bit different, otherwise uh, there was no case for publishing anything. And then it would, be, it would have triggered some kind of commands and so forth. So we had some reasons not to do that. And we, have another, we had another reason, which was that we had decided from the very beginning in the ECB that we would speak with one voice. And so the idea that we had inside the uh, governing council of the ECB various positions and that we took a decision, but some were pro and other were cons, and we could identify those who were cons, uh, is, uh, was something that we considered very bad. Because again, if you are in a multi-nation entity and that one particular governor says, I was against and I am against, it of course not, it does not facilitate communication of the sole authority which really exists, which is the majority of the central bank uh, governing council. Uh, and that's the reason why, again, we didn't want to, to identify the individuals, when in the other central banks, identification of the individuals uh, who were opposing the decision is not a problem uh, of that kind. On the contrary, it was considered by the other central banks something which would prove full transparency and uh, uh, would not have any, I would say, counterproductive uh, dimension, any counterproductive element. We finally uh, have decided that uh, for uh, the sake of transparency, it was nevertheless good to be more explicit in the listing of the pro and cons of all decisions, not necessarily mentioning the individual positions taken by the uh, various members of the uh, governing council. That was the, the fifth dimension that I listed. A sixth dimension that I can list also is something which is also very important. Before the crisis, the, uh, a number of central banks were considering that they should not criticize the other policies of their own government or of their parliament. And that the reason why it was not uh, appropriate for uh, the Fed or for Bank of England to embark on criticizing the fiscal policy or on criticizing the structural policies of uh, their own government. The uh, sentiment was that well, there was some kind of division of labor. The uh, central bank was responsible for monetary policy and uh, should be, and in, in the case of the UK, it's been very solemnly decided quite recently, should be independent in taking these decisions of monetary policy. But uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, the division of labor would recommend that uh, uh, equally uh, 
the central bank would not intervene in the fiscal policies in particular. And that was uh, something which uh, was uh, very, very uh, clear in the eyes of, uh, I have to say, everybody. It was not the tradition in, uh, for, for a number of reasons in continental Europe, neither in Germany nor in France, nor in other countries, where on the contrary the society, uh, the, the democracy, was considering that after all the central bank governor could pass a number of messages that, uh, after all, would have a certain merit and uh, that would not be contrary to the uh, overall, I would say, equilibrium of, of the uh, division of labor that I already mentioned. After the crisis, in the crisis and after the crisis, this um, division, conceptual uh, opposition, if I may, between the two modalities of uh, sending messages have been more or less eliminated. And I could see myself, the Federal Reserve and Bank of England embarking when, of course, uh, they were judging that it was necessary on mentioning fiscal policies or structural policies as part of their overall messages. So this is something which is important in terms of, you know, functioning of our society. And uh, I really consider that it is one of the uh, conclusions that uh, the central banks, and I have to say the government, because it, it, it signals a change in the perception of both, I would say, governments on the one hand and central banks on the other hand. A seventh uh, dimension of uh, convergence was the uh, convergence towards the idea that banking surveillance could be or should be, should be close or very close to the central bank. Before the crisis, we had two camps. One was the camp of those saying central banks should not be concerned by banking surveillance. In that camp, you had the Bundesbank, you had uh, a number of uh, central banks in continental Europe, like uh, the, the Scandinavian central bank, uh, <coughs> you had uh, the Belgium Central Bank, and you had also the UK Central Bank, and by the way, also the Japanese Central Bank. But you see a, a division, strong division uh, in Europe, because the other central banks in Europe were practicing this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, central bank being close to uh, banking surveillance, like in France, like in uh, Spain, like in Italy. And the United States of America was uh, also in the camp of those central banks that were considered uh, having certain responsibility uh, in terms of banking surveillance. The crisis changed totally the situation. Bank of England changed drastically and became back because it was a previous responsibility of Bank of England that had been eliminated, but Bank of England came back to banking surveillance. The ECB itself, in the crisis, took the responsibility, which was possible according to the treaty, took the responsibility of exerting bank surveillance through a special, uh, I would say, branch, a special arm, but is responsible ultimately for banking surveillance. The US could see more or less reinforced his own responsibility in banking surveillance. And so you have there really something which is very, very strong in terms of conceptual convergence. Equally, uh, the idea that the central banks were uh, and should be very close to the prevention of systemic risk and to the prevention and the, 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 the make clear that uh, they have a special responsibility in terms of financial stability. And that, uh, I would say, uh, concept of preventing systemic risk should be close to the central bank is also something which appeared in the crisis, was not elaborated before the crisis, appeared in the crisis in a way which is uh, uh, quite impressive because in the crisis, you had the setting up of a number of new committees on both sides of the Atlantic that had this responsibility with a very close involvement of the Fed, of the ECB, 
the European Systemic Risk Board, which I chaired myself at the very beginning, you know, being a, a case in point in uh, uh, underlying this new responsibility. So there you have also a convergence, which is quite impressive. And of course, I had last, as always, the most important element of convergence as the last one, and I will draw your attention to uh, the fact that this is really very important. The very definition of price stability was an element before the crisis of great dispute, not only uh, between uh, uh, economists, but also between central banks. Uh, before the crisis, you had two I would say camp, if I may, the, the, the metaphor is not appropriate, but two schools. One school was you should be clear in uh, expressing what, uh, what are your definition of price stability or what are your goals as regards uh, monetary policy, what, uh, what is your target as regards your inflation targeting concept, if you have an inflation targeting concept. And this was the uh, position of uh, Bank of England and of the ECB. Since the very beginning, the ECB was uh, keen on defining what it would consider as price stability, price stability being the primary mandate uh, given by the treaty. And uh, we said uh, less than two, and we uh, precised, but close to two, which meant in our uh, own vision that the, I would say, inflation expectations in a medium term perspective should be around 1.8, 1 1.9%. Uh, that has been clarified so since the very beginning of the uh, euro, since the very setting up of the central bank of the, of, uh, the euro area. As I already said, the UK adopted inflation targeting and uh, said that the target was 2%. So you had two central banks with 2% mentioning explicitly in their target or definition of price stability. As, as you know, the ECB uh, in terms uh, conceptually has a definition of price stability, not necessarily a target uh, as uh, the inflation targeting uh, concept uh, recommends. In the United States of America, you had no definition of price stability and no explicit target. And in Japan, you had no definition of price stability and no explicit target. In the crisis, and uh, more precisely, the 25, 25th of January 2012, the Federal Reserve said what we considered as price stability is 2% in the medium run. Very, very important. The, the crisis started in 2008. Uh, I mentioned 15 of September 2008 for the, I would say, acute episode of the crisis. You see uh, a number, a small number of years afterwards, you have this definition. The idea was if we want to stabilize inflation expectations in the medium long term, in a universe of turbulence, in a universe of very, very uncertain evolution of uh, the real economy, of markets, uh, in a universe where we could be hit by new shocks of great magnitude, it would be as important uh, uh, as, uh, uh, I would say, having a good monetary policy and taking good decisions, also to mention to all market participants, investors, savers, uh, I would say both in the US and in the rest of the world, what is really our long-term, medium long-term definition of price stability. And in Japan, it is the 4th of April 2013, so uh, approximately one year afterwards, that they have decided to precise that they had an inflation definition of price stability, an inflation target, which was 2%, equally 2%, so you see. The four central banks, at the moment I'm speaking, when they were in two totally different schools, are now in the same school. They have not only the same 
school, but also the same definition of price stability. And I draw your attention to the fact that it is quite important because after all, the four currencies that are issued by these four central banks are the currencies that are in the present basket of the SDR. So the SDR, which is uh, supposed to be uh, the very heart of, uh, and uh, of course it's called to expand as you know, and uh, the renminbi is on its way to join, and the IMF said that uh, it would be appropriate for renminbi to join in. But presently we have the four currencies that are in this you know, so-called global currency, or I would say anticipation of a global currency, and they have the same definition of price stability medium term. It is something which uh, was not noted in real time. I'm very proud because I noted that as something very, very important. And uh, uh, as you see, it's new. I mean, it's really history in the making. We are speaking of things that are going on and are full of uh, very, very important consequences, potentially. So I have listed my ninth, um, uh, I would say, convergence uh, dimensions. Let me uh, only mention, because we, we concluded on price stability, that the main problem of all those central banks at the moment I'm speaking is precisely not to prevent inflation from going up and up and up and up over and above the 2%, which was more or less the normal situation of central bankers practically uh, all the time since World War II. But we are now, and they are now, in a situation where both CPI and core inflation, at least the measure of core that they adopt, are below the definition of price stability. And uh, only, for, only for you to have precise figures, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, in the euro area December, so if I'm not misled, is 0.2%. Has to be checked. Maybe, maybe it's November. Uh, U.S. November 0.5, U.K. November 0.1, Japan November 0.3. Core inflation, because you will tell me, of course, uh, with the commodities and oil and so forth, it's not surprising that you are very low level. Core inflation, euro area 0.9, U.S., the core that the U.S. Fed is looking at 1.3, U.K. 1.2, Japan minus 0.1. A little bit surprising that Japan core is below uh, CPI. But all taken into account, core inflation as well as CPI, consumer price index, are uh, at a very low level. China, because I mentioned the fact that the renminbi was on its way to join in, which is a very important issue also with a lot of potential consequences. And of course, China is, uh, you know, uh, making a lot of headlines, uh, as uh, as you could see uh, yesterday and today. Uh, China is 1.5 as regards the CPI and 1.5 as regards the core. All currencies that are in or potentially in the uh, basket of the SDR have inflation, which is very low and below their definition of price stability which uh, again uh, has to be fully understood, fully explained, uh, because it happens even if they are doing things that are for most of them remaining extraordinary. So I had promised a second part on my exposition, uh, which uh, would be um, uh, other open questions. So I, I will uh, only perhaps with your uh, authorization, uh, list <laughs> the open questions where I, st I would stand ready to respond to questions that you would have, because otherwise it would take too long a period of time, even if these questions are very interesting and stimulating, in my opinion. So I'm listing them. First, a relatively open question. What is exactly the very nature of unconventional measures? I have spoken as part of our convergence that all central banks had embarked on uh, 
unconventional measures, quantitative, uh, whether uh, on balance sheet or off balance sheet. What are, what are exactly the reason why we embark on those measures? Uh, are they several, only one dimension or several dimension? Are they only there because it was necessary to embark in new accommodating quote-unquote devices when we were at the zero lower bound? So interest rates being at zero, uh, you had to pursue accommodation because it was still needed by other means and the unconventional measures, the QEs, would only m signal that uh, we are at zero level bound uh, and uh, that we had to pursue that? Or is it something of a different nature, namely a way to counter uh, grave and immediate threat of sudden stops of uh, various markets, grave and immediate threat of evaporation of liquidity in a number of markets that would uh, require uh, particular action, uh, but uh, again, an action which would be more of uh, countering destabilization and ensuring uh, more financial stability, avoiding catastrophe than pursuing monet traditional monetary policy by other means. So I, I, uh, let that, I have two full pages <laughs> of discussion on that. Uh, and, and these are uh, summing up of the discussion. So you could see I could speak probably for half an hour on, on that alone. So other, another uh, interesting question. You, you heard me several times speaking of on balance sheet measures and off balance sheet measures. This is for me very bold. Practically nobody speaks of the off balance sheet measures. Uh, in the case of the ECB, for obvious reasons, we had considered from the very beginning that some off-balance sheet measures were absolutely necessary. And I, ex I will explain uh, why very rapidly. Because the financing of the European economy is made massively through banks say 80% of the financing of the euro area economy is made through banks and 20% through markets. In the US, 80% through markets, 20% through banks. So we, we are in, a, in two totally different universe in terms of the structure of financing of the economy on both sides of the Atlantic. Not surprisingly, since the very beginning of the crisis, the US Fed had to purchase tradable securities because had they not embarked on purchasing tradable securities, they would have let uh, absence of uh, liquidity, uh, I would say, generalized on their own markets. And so the sudden stop of the financing of the US economy would have been uh, documented. So they concentrated on what was necessary to maintain as well as possible in those circumstances, an appropriate financing of the US economy. In the case of Europe, where the financing is made through banks, our main problem was to be sure that the banks would have all the liquidity what was needed. Otherwise, we would have the sudden stop of the functioning of banks and then the sudden stop of the financing of the economy. And that's the reason why the concept, the first uh, non-standard concept that we, uh, decide, we invented was illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. That's what we call in, in English full allotment at fixed rate. And we started that uh, at the very beginning of uh, the start of the first episode of the crisis I mentioned, namely the subprime. The 9th of August 2007, we decided to give all commercial banks in Europe all the liquidity that they needed. They asked us 95 billion euros, which was an enormous amount. I mean, it was, you know, more than a hundred billion dollars in one shot. And we gave 95 billion euros in one shot. And it was the start uh, 
of the, uh, I would say, crisis in a way, and uh, that was a very important moment. But then, after Lehman Brothers' uh, bankruptcy, we generalized the uh, supply of liquidity in an unlimited, unlimited fashion at fixed rate. And at the moment I'm speaking, the ECB is committed to supply unlimited liquidity to all banks in Europe uh, at various duration and up to, uh, in my opinion, they extended that uh, probably even to 17, uh, has to be, to be checked. But uh, it on, only to demonstrate, and this is not in the balance sheet, of course, it's a promise to deliver all the liquidity that would be needed if need be, if there are new problems, new difficulties that are emerging. So it could be one trillion euros more, it could be two trillion euros more, it could be three trillion euros more, because that, more than what is presently uh, asked by the commercial banks, uh, because again, uh, the eligible collateral, which is at the disposal of the commercial banks, in uh, the euro system represents uh, several trillions, trillions uh, euros. So I already mentioned the OMT uh, coming after SMP. SMP was a program to purchase treasuries of Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy and Spain. Uh, the OMT is another program which is totally off balance sheet at least uh, until now, uh, which has never functioned, but says that if need be, that could be uh, activated. And uh, of course, everybody knows that these two ba of balance sheet uh, commitment that I already mentioned, the full allotment on the one hand and the OMT on the other hand, are for real. They are really there. They exist and they play an important part, if, even if they are not visible in the balance sheet of the central bank. Uh, a third open question, which uh, I would like to uh, also discuss with you if uh, you have, we have time, would be the many dimension of central bank independence. I can go back, of course, to uh, the reason why all our democracies have considered that all taken into account independence of the central banks uh, were uh, appropriate and this has been decided uh, quite solemnly by our democracies. Uh, it's still discussed. Uh, you still have a lot of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, question mark on uh, uh, the reason why in a democracy you give uh, so, uh, such room for maneuvering to uh, independent institution. I consider myself that it is probably an important dimension of, uh, I would say, the evolution of our democracies, that you have more authorities that are independent. Uh, uh, and of course, in that case, uh, the central bank is only one particular authority amongst others. But I would like to draw your attention to something which is uh, quite impressive. In the crisis, the independence of the central bank was utilized paradoxically in many respects to take decisions that were extremely bold, swift, very rapid, very bold, that would not necessarily have been taken by the political sphere. Because the political sphere would not necessarily have been aware of the fact that this was necessary. And I have a case in point. The Fed, as we could see, was preparing uh, action from the very beginning of the, of the crisis, from the very announcement of the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, and uh, took decisions that were, again, very bold and very, very swift and are still reproached to the central bank, to the, to the Fed by part of the, uh, I would say, political sphere in the United States of America. There is still a dispute on that. When the uh, government of the US decided that uh, to block the collapse of the system, you had to have an appropriation by the Congress of around $1 trillion. It was the TARP program. They presented the TARP program 
to the Congress, and the Congress said no. So, uh, you know, even if we were uh, several weeks after the start of the crisis, even if we were in a situation where the collapse of the financial sphere and the start of the collapse of the real economy sphere in the United States was there, obviously, the political elite in the US was not convinced because the appropriation of a trillion dollars was something which was too big for them to uh, decide. And so they had to mature and the decision was taken in a second reading at the moment where you know, the Dow Jones was falling like a stone, and uh, at the moment where it was more obvious that the catastrophe was there. So you see, the independence of the central banks can function two ways. One way is to protect the central bank from political decisions that would be unwise. Another way might be to be able to take decisions that are commanded by the gravity, the extreme gravity of a situation, judged by wise persons at a moment where the democracy, the democratic functioning is not yet aware of the full gravity of the situation. This also is a remark which is uh, quite bold, as you can see, and uh, not made very often. And I had a, a, a number of other things, but it's too late now. I will stop there because it seems that we have sufficient uh, food for thought, for discussion and for contradiction. So thank you for your attention. Hi, everybody. I'm Jay Christopher. This is Ezra and we are presenting today. So we looked primarily at the other paper um, that we are just starting to get into. So transitions very well there. And we're doing central banking and fundamentals of open, fundamentals and open questions. So we got together and started talking about all the things that we'd read and we had about 50 or 60 questions that we wanted to try to condense into a 15 to 20 minute presentation. So what we're going to have to do is do an incredibly fast summary, four slide summary of a 100 page paper and then go into three topical discussions. Uh, Ezra is going to start with some of the particulars about the response to the crisis and what that actually looked like and some of the uh, actual s specifics on the ground. I'm going to talk much broader about the nature and the point of a central bank, picking up a lot of these points of central bank independence and how do we think about central banks and why we have them. And then we're going to ask some, a couple very pr pragmatic questions about how decisions are made in central banks and what it actually looks like to be inside of a central bank. So from the report. The report splits the idea of what central banks were doing in the crisis into two general ideas. First, they had to serve as lender of last resort and provide liquidity, in the case of America, to keep the markets operating, and in the case of the EU, to keep the banks from going under. And so that was the first goal, was to keep the system from completely melting down. And more or less, they did a pretty good job on that. That, that worked the way it was supposed to. Um, the bigger problem was the use of monetary policy to stimulate aggregate demand. That was the second thing of trying to keep the interest rates as low as possible, as long as possible. And that's been dragging on much, much longer and has not been nearly as successful as the lender of last resort capabilities. So that brings us to some of the limits of monetary policy, which is something that the, the document really stresses and talks about what monetary policy can and can't do. So, Central banks are not equipped to fight modern depressions on their own. This is one of the central things that this report focuses on. The idea that central banks are really good at jumping in early, before Congresses, before parliaments can do something, to be a backstop, to start, the, to start fighting the fire. But then, at some point, governments need to come in, and that's when the real heavy lifting needs to happen for actually solving the crisis and working on preventing the next crisis problem so far we've had is that government management has been rather underwhelming and that we're stuck in a position where the central bank is doing everything it can to keep the system afloat and governments either aren't able or aren't willing to do what they need to do to get the system going again. So the ultimate resolution of the crisis can only be dealt with through the arms of government other than the central bank. <laughs> 
So a couple lessons that we learned from the crisis so far. One of the big things that struck me as really interesting in this report is that total debt levels matter and credit levels matter, not just public debt. Coming from Kingston last year, that was something Steve Keen would yell at us all the time. So it was interesting reading that in a more mainstream or orthodox central bank report. The idea that avoiding excessive credit dynamics is very important for fostering stability was something that, that made sense from the more heterodox side of things that we've been learning here. Uh, dangerous imbalances can build up even over periods of price stability. That was something I thought was really interesting and I'll cover later talking about the idea of what a central bank is and what it should do. But the idea that just because you can manage price stability doesn't mean everything's okay. Uh, and the standard models, particularly DGSE models, completely blew up when everything started going badly, and we should probably do something about that. So going forward, just a couple points on this. Uh, loose monetary policy has very obvious short-term benefits, but we're not exactly sure what the long-term consequences are going to be. This creates a problem because there's an incentive and a structure to where it makes a lot more sense to keep the monetary policies going too long because we can see the benefits and we might be building the next bubble or creating some monster that we don't even know how to talk about yet. Um, the central banks also need to balance a responsible responsibility for price stability with this new focus on bubbles and debt and the buildup in imbalances. This was another thing the report stressed quite a bit is that we now have this dual role of central banks and that there's very likely going to be conflicts between the two. And the report was very clear that price stability is number one. That is the number one objective of the central banks and that the other things are good, but if there are conflicts, price stability is where we start. And finally, economists should revisit the work of an older generation of people like Keynes and Hayek and Minsky because there's a lot of really interesting and good things in there that we've lost and we need to come back to that. Uh, thanks, Jay Christopher. Now I will continue with discussing uh, some of the uh, responses of the ECB to the crisis and some controversial points. Uh, my first topic is uh, actually about one of the this unconventional measures that uh, Mr. Tusha has also mentioned in his presentation. Uh, but before going to that point and raising a question about it, I will give a uh, short uh, background on what uh, made this uh, policy proposal necessary in the euro area. Um, as we all know, governments in the eurozone uh, issued that in a currency that they actually uh, did not have control over and they couldn't uh, guarantee to the bondholders that they will always have the uh, necessary liquidity to pay off the bond at its maturity. And the absence of such a guarantee in the Eurozone made the uh, sovereign bond markets prone to the liquidity crisis. When investors lost confidence in the so-called peripheral countries of the Eurozone, then they massively sold the government bonds of these countries, pushing interest rates to unsustainably high levels as we can see from this figure that the interest rate of, uh, on 10 years government bond yields in countries like Greece and Portugal and Ireland um, increased sharply. And the euros obtained from these sales uh, were invested in core European countries such as Germany, which means that capital flows from core countries to peripheral countries, which had previously supported demand growth, went sharply into reverse and made it impossible for peripheral countries to roll over their debt at reasonably interest rates. The uh, G30 report that Jay Christopher has just summarized argues that the ECB actually took important measures to stabilize bond yields in peripheral countries. For example, uh, the ECB firstly introduced the Securities Markets Program and then later introduced outright monetary transactions, which is also known as whatever it takes mandate after uh, Draghi's announcement that the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to uh, preserve the Eurozone. However, um, it has been argued that the way the 
uh, outright monetary transaction program was designed is actually very problematic. First of all, um, the ECB doesn't purchase sovereign bonds with the highest risk premium, which means that the ECB does not buy government bonds of Greece, for example. And second of all, and most importantly, the benefits of this program come with severe austerity measures set by the European st Stability Mechanism. And as we have been witnessing, these conditions has prompted civil unrest in countries like Greece and reduce potential for recovery in these countries by lowering demand, income and economic performance. So it has been argued by many economists, for example by uh, De Grove, that even though the ECB has actually virtually infinite capacity to buy government bonds, uh, it did not fully act as lender of last resort in uh, government bond markets by putting forward some concerns such as moral hazard which um, actually could have been taken care of by, by maybe creating a uh, separate institution which can control the level of government debts in future or which was not a problem for the ECB when ECB provided 1000 billion euros to banks at the end of 2011 and early 2012. So one of our questions is, do you agree with the views that uh, sovereign debt crisis in the monetary union could be actually resolved if the ECB would take on the role as a lender of last resort for all governments in the European monetary union? And my second point is about the emergency liquidity assistance. Uh, let me first explain shortly what it means. Um, Euro area credit institutions can receive central bank credit through emergency liquidity assistance in exceptional circumstances. According to ECB's definition, uh, liquidity assistance means the provision of central bank money and any other assistance that may lead to an increase in the central bank money by a, a European national central bank to a solvent financial institution which is facing uh, temporary liquidity problems. It is important, I think, to note that the ECB's governing council, which is made up of the central bank governors from 19 nations that use the euro and uh, top six officials of the ECB, can uh, have the right to block requests from national central banks uh, for liquidity assistance with a two-thirds majority. Now I want to look at a brief history of the liquidity assistance given to Greek banks last year. Uh, in April 2015, Mario Draghi gave his assurance that uh, the Greek banks uh, can continue to rely on liquidity assistance. However, later on last year in September and October, the Governing Council of the ECB has decided to decrease the uh, liquidity assistance given to Greek banks. And this decision has raised uh, a lot of questions about the treatment of a member country in the Eurozone and about the political independence of the ECB and so on. So our uh, next question is, do you think that by refusing to extend additional emergency liquidity assistance, the ECB has decided that Greece must leave the Eurozone? Do you think that this action was a legal necessity as argued by um, some, I guess, some people from the ECB? And if yes, then does this imply that there is an important flaw in the construction of the Eurozone? Or do you think that this action was a political judgment call by the ECB? And finally, I, uh, we have a question about um, public investment uh, in the Eurozone and how central bank uh, can do something about it. One of the areas in which policy measures didn't have much um, effect has been in restoring bank lending in the Eurozone. And uh, in our opinion, an important part of this problem uh, 
which is not uh, adequately acknowledged in G30 report is that uh, the private sector is still risk averse and fails to invest enough to restore demand. So our question is with increased liquidity not filtering into real economy, do you think that public investments can be actually the key to the recovery in the Eurozone? And what role does the ECB have in helping uh, to finance public investment? And for example, can the ECB help the European Investment Bank through buying its bonds? Now, uh, Jay Christopher will continue discussing the nature of central banking. Thank you. And looking like we've got a very little amount of time, so I'm going to kind of zing through this. Um, so, zooming way, way out, what's the point of a central bank? Why do we have these things? So, the report talked quite a bit about that, particularly in the beginning. Uh, the ultimate objective of the central bank has been to support sustainable economic growth through the pursuit of price stability and financial stability. So, economic growth, that's the ultimate objective, um, which is important because that means price stability is not a good in and of itself, but is valued because it's traditionally associated with creating the conditions needed for economic growth. So my question is, if there are other concerns that consistently become greater factors for determining growth, possibly debt buildups, possibly deficient demand, something of that nature, should central banks be retooled legally to be able to deal with these issues that might be more serious than price stability in the 21st century? Uh, the, G the G30 report acknowledged this tension and talked about how price stability and combating imbalances could be in conflict, and that's something we needed to address. Um, but it came down squarely on the side of price stability, and I, there wasn't a whole lot of explanation for that within the report. And so I was wondering about that issue. Um, and so here's the millennials perspective. Most of us were born in the late 80s, early 90s. So this is our life. This is inflation in the United States. And as you can see, it's under 4% almost my entire life. Um, here's Europe where it's fairly similar, almost as low. So price stability, you guys have done a great job. It's been very low and stable. Um, here's unemployment in the United States, which does not look the same, which is sad. And, and so you can see the crises don't seem to really correspond in an obvious way to the price stability. Uh, here's the core of Europe for my European friends, as far as the same up and down dynamics in Spain. Don't think I forgot about you. You just didn't fit on the last chart. Um, so that's sort of what we're facing as young people, is seeing that price stability, we know it's important. And you can tell theoretically, it's obviously something that central banks should value. But it seems strange that that's the number one issue without any discussion, that that's not something that's actively debated. Uh, so, going a step even more radical, why economic growth? Is that necessarily have to be the thing that we're trying to maximize here? So, central banks are designed to promote economic growth, and that might be too narrow. Economic growth is a great thing, don't get me wrong, it's something I like quite a bit. But if we're talking about problems facing advanced market economies, which specifically I had in mind the United States, European Union, Japan, Bank of Japan and England. That was the four mentioned in the first paper as sort of the countries that we're talking about in this presentation. Um, I, just the first couple things that came to my head is the problems I feel our generation is facing. Uh, climate change, ecological collapse, we all might be underwater fairly soon, and that's something that scares me. Uh, international inequalities, this idea that a lot of the world has realized that there's not really a development strategy in the works for them, or that the things that we're trying aren't succeeding. Uh, that could be something very dangerous, particularly for rich countries. And then the domestic inequalities and the failure to produce a convincing response to the crisis. We see that with the far right in Europe, and we're starting to see that with the very far right in the United States. And so that's something, that's something I'm concerned about and something that I think that central banks might want to think about. And not, not saying that they can legally think about that right now, but politically that should be a more open question of what do we want our central banks to do. So why am I enlisting the central banks to save the world in all of this? Well, the main thing is that they have the power of money creation, and that is a very, very important thing in society. So governments have all kinds of constraints, particularly uh, governments within the EU that don't even have the central bank control of their own money. But 
central banks don't face the same problem. So there's a lot more access to solutions here. There's a lot more room to be able to maneuver, particularly thinking of climate change. We need financing for a green revolution. We need more, the financing and the money and the credit to be available to fund this transition. And so a very natural place to look for that could be central banks. But we need to politically change the rules first to be able to allow them to focus on things. So here's a chart that I like quite a bit talking about the relation between the narrowly defined money supply and inflation. This is for the United States. And you see when the crisis started, we tripled the money supply. And so far the inflation hasn't come yet. And every week I see an article telling me inflation's right around the corner. And theoretically it should come at some point, but it's not here yet. And so as long as it's not here yet, it seems like there should at least be a discussion about whether we use this opportunity, whether we use this crisis to fund things that could save the world and save society. So the sad part about that is that that really would be the end of central bank independence. Uh, it, it's sort of hard to imagine a situation in which we have governments telling central banks they must save the world from climate change or from instabilities and have them still be independent in any real political way. So I was thinking, what what are the objectives and why do we have central bank independence in the first place? And it seems like the main reason that this really makes sense is to promote price stability because governments aren't trustworthy with their money, which historically is a very good claim. And the idea is you need to separate the central bank because if you have the governments telling the central bank what to do, they will eventually print too much money and then you'll have inflation. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not challenging that claim at all, but what I am thinking is that it's very possible that price stability shouldn't be the number one thing we're focusing on right now, uh, that that should be one goal among many for the institutions that we use to create our money. So we have just two very quick questions here at the end about what it's actually like to be in a central bank and how decisions get made. Because it's from the outside, it's kind of a black box. And it's really exciting to have someone here who can actually tell us how this happens. Thank you. Thanks. So um, during my research for this uh, joint seminar, uh, I come across an interesting paper uh, written by Bassem and Ronalds, which is called Policymaking of the European Central Bank during the crisis, do personalities matter? Apparently there is an hypothesis by Friedman which emphasized the extraordinary importance of uh, accidents of personality in order to explain how monetary policies were uh, strongly dependent on the behavior of individual central bankers. And this uh, hypothesis is, um, was tried to uh, analyze for different central bankers, such as between uh, Walker and Greenspan and the Fed. And this paper uh, questions to what extent the policymaking of the ECB during the crisis has been influenced by Mr. Tushet's and Draghi's different personalities. The argument is that since Mr. Tushet was deeply involved in institution building process of the uh, Eurozone, while Draghi was not institutionally bound to the ECB, this prevented Mr. Tushet from significant departures in policy making, uh, while Mr. Draghi was more able to initiate changes as an outsider. As an example, this figure shows that uh, when Mr. Draghi uh, came into office in late 2011, uh, one of the first things he did was to decrease the interest rates. So um, our question is, what do you think about this analysis? And more generally on the last point, um, something the speaker in the morning had mentioned today is that when, if, if we get jobs in the future, which was an interesting point, um, in any of these large governmental organizations, that we're going to be a cog in a machine where the institution itself has priorities and ideas and history, where the institution itself has priorities that w we, even the people at the top aren't able to really change. Um, and you hear stories of people like Joe Stieglitz going to the IMF and not being able to change the culture there. And so 
on this question of personality versus institution, how do you see that? Where's sort of the line on how much of it is there's nothing I could do, it was the institution, and how much of it really is that there's room for people to get in and change? So to end, we have to ask the heterodox question. Um, we're here learning heterodox economics, and it seems like so the article made a lot of use of Keynes and Minsky, which is really interesting because that's not something that we see a lot of, particularly in published academic papers. Um, and they explicitly said that we need to spend time looking at older thinkers and other schools of thought, which is great because that's what we're doing here. But it didn't seem like there was any direct mention of either the individuals themselves or the arguments made by some of the intellectual descendants of these thinkers. Thinking of things like the post-Keynesians, the Marxists, the institutionalists, the ecological, people, that that was completely missing um, from this paper, and I know that this paper was a very unique thing because it was a, a group of different people having to agree on things, but more generally that doesn't seem to be part of the conversation. And so that's my question is, are these outside voices part of the conversation when decisions are being made in these central banks? Uh, do the ideas ever come up? So what is that decision-making process like? And how much room is there for non-orthodox ideas to get into that process? Uh, second, the article was surprisingly critical of the pre-crisis DGSE models, which is really refreshing. Um, one of the, I guess, impressions that we get is that the models failed horribly, but everyone still loves them and defends them. And so it was interesting hearing from the central banks themselves saying that there's a huge problem with the models, but we don't know what to do. So that's my question is, well, what are you looking for new alternatives? And if so, have you considered some of the alternatives being proposed by the heterodox schools? And if you have and found them lacking, I was wondering if you could talk about that as far as sort of the, the deficiencies in what the non-orthodox people are proposing. And then finally, what advice would you have for young economists like us who are being trained in these outside traditions but want to have a real impact on policy and are afraid of getting stuck in a trap where we're not able to get into the institutions or not able to get into the conversations because of the training we've had and because of the ideas we bring with us? Um, our timekeeper here can let us know whether or not we've got time for bonus questions. <laughs> we have five minutes or we're, oh. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we structured it so we would have, so she could say no. Um, so I copied these quotations from an uh, interview of Mr. Trisha uh, with Martin Wolf uh, for the lunch with FD. Uh, at some point in the inter interview, Mr. Tisha says that the recipe for the new European economy is to be as competitive as possible. And uh, Martin Wolf asks, then you would have to persuade the emerging countries to run deficits. But they are very nervous about that because they associate them with crisis. And Mr. Tisha responds by saying that now a number of them have a very impressive amount of insurance with enormous reserve assets. In any case, it wouldn't be abnormal for the wealthiest economies of the world to run some current account surpluses and to export capital. So my question is, um, when I look at the different development experiences of, for example, uh, South uh, Asian countries on the one hand and Latin American countries on the other end, I think that actually export-led growth can be used as a development tool for some uh, emerging market economies. And given the fact that in order for these countries to uh, reach the level of development of wealthiest economies, then I think it would be actually more normal if developing countries run small amount of uh, current account surpluses against uh, wealthiest nations. So. My question is, uh, is there uh, anything that changed uh, in your idea about this export-led strategy for wealthiest economies versus developing countries? And the timekeeper saying this is our last bonus question. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm fascinated by this question of when do we finally raise rates? When does this end? Because my Keynesian training says that unless there's some kind of outside force that raises demand, this could go on forever. And so this idea that we've been in the recession, what, eight years now? Nine, 10, 15, 20 years? How long do we have to go? 
uh, at some point, do we have to raise rates? It, it seems like we do, but but that's that's really interesting to me. And it's interesting that the the Fed finally raised rates barely, but it's a signal that it is starting. And so the questions that come out of this is that inflation is still well below 2%, and now it's below 0% in some places. So what do you think about the Fed's decision to raise rates? And more importantly, how do you see the ECB playing this out? Where does this go, particularly if inflation stays at near deflation levels? Can we keep 0% interest rates forever? Um, yeah, how, how does that go? How does this end? So. This is how the presentation ends. <laughs> okay, fine. You have a, a fantastic uh, way of, uh, of going from back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> that this is very well directed, if I may. Bravo. So, <laughs> I have so many questions that uh, you will forgive me if uh, uh, you, you will have to remind me that uh, I did not exactly respond to that, that question or this other question. Um, fir first, I, would, uh, I, would I, I will go through it uh, in the order where I could get it, but <laughs> it was a very, very complex uh, uh, stuff, if I may. Uh, first, as regards the G30 uh, work, uh, it's not an academic work. There is no permanent mentioning of the article by X, Y, and Z. So you have to consider that it was deliberately not uh, a, a number of those who have worded this, uh, this document, of course, are publishing a lot of things uh, that are like of an academic nature. But don't be surprised if you do not see all the names you, you would uh, like to see it in it. Uh, it's not the, the purpose. The purpose is really to try to squeeze the lemon and get all the juice that you can have from people that have experience, that lived uh, you know, this uh, very difficult period that have a long, a long experience because a number of them have seen, you know, uh, uh, problems of hyperinflation. They have, you know, gone through all the period, the Volcker period, where we, we fought against hyperinflation. Uh, we, we have experienced, a large number of us, the period of stagflation, where we had stagnation and very high level of inflation. So, so we, we had uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of experience also, which uh, uh, seems to be quite different from <laughs> what you have in mind <laughs> with what you call your Keynesian uh, uh, approach. Uh, so, again, for the G30, I, I really consider that it is a fair uh, crystallization of, I would say, the present experience of those who uh, have uh, all kind of political sensitivity. In the G30, our um, uh, honorary chairman is Paul Volcker, and uh, he's, um, he has a fantastic, uh, you know, integrity, uh, personal integrity. Even if uh, he had to fight inflation uh, in a time where inflation was uh, very, very bad. Let me also mention that you're used to stability, but high inflation is dramatic for the weakest people, the poorest people, and the, uh, I would say, a vulnerable segment of, of the population. And you, you could document that uh, in all times of very high inflation, or of course, hyperinflation. And um, uh, the destruction of society that is linked with hyperinflation is something which uh, a number of us have in mind because uh, it's not because France uh, gone through uh, hyperinflation. Uh, and even for my German uh, friends, uh, it's not because they have themselves experienced hyperinflation, but they have the memory at least that it created a lot of problems uh, between the two world war. But uh, it is because a lot of us have the experience of uh, emerging countries experiencing hyperinflation, in particular Latin America. And uh, th this is something which uh, you have also to, to consider. Uh, because again, you were uh, happy enough not to know what is uh, a high level of inflation 
hyperinflation. You have also to know that the, when you ask the people whether they are satisfied with the present level of inflation or not, highly paradoxically, practically in all countries in Europe, they say that inflation is too high. So if we consider in our democracy that the sentiment of the people plays an important role, uh, I must confess I'm always <laughs> amazed myself because I, I would think that at least we should have some recognition that in that you know, dimension we did quite a good job. And uh, that, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's much less flattering in many other dimensions of society and economy, but no, even that is not considered a real success by our people. So uh, take that into, into uh, account also. Now, uh, uh, what I took for a question, or, uh, uh, but it was more, uh, I would say, uh, uh, mentioning what we said in the paper, in the G30 paper, uh, it is absolutely clear that we are asking the central banks uh, to deliver everything, to deliver price stability, of course, but also to deliver growth, to deliver job creation. And uh, uh, central banks are more or less accepting that uh, price stability being a necessary condition in their view for uh, having growth and job creation, it's not unfair to ask them to contribute. And I think it's not unfair. They, they have to contribute as much as possible. But if we forget the other partners, what are we doing? If we forget that you have enormous responsibility in the hands of the uh, governments, uh, because there are fiscal policies, because there are revenue policies, because they have, uh, you have uh, structural policies that are supposed to elevate the growth potential of the country. You have also all the policies that are associated with uh, more or less inequality in the country, which are totally depending on the governments and parliaments. You have the social partners that have also a very important role to play. You have the private sector. If we accept that we, central banks, have to deliver price stability, growth and job creation, or why not, as you are more or less suggesting, growth and job creation, forget about price stability, uh, we are only permitting the other partners not to do their job. And to the extent that then we would probably have a policy which would be highly imbalanced, we are only paving the way for the next crisis. And who suffers most in the next crisis? The most vulnerable segment of the population, the poorest, those who are uh, without you know, the appropriate cushion to weather the difficulty. So being serious in their own decision making by all the central bank and all other partners is decisive in the long run. Otherwise, you are not only, as I said, paving the way for the next catastrophe. And this is important. And I will take one of the issues that you yourself mentioned. Take Europe. Take Europe. You have a lab in Europe. You have div different countries. They are on their starting block. On the 1st January 1999, they are all starting their course with the euro and with a certain level of imbalances or uh, surpluses, uh, uh, surpluses or, or deficits, with a certain level of, uh, of uh, competitiveness, a certain level of unit labor cost expressed in euros. It's more or less balanced at the very beginning. There is no drama in Greece. No drama in Portugal, no drama in uh, Spain. And uh, there is uh, uh, some countries that are reasonably competitive uh, in terms of you know, uh, judgment of the, of the market, uh, of the consumers uh, in Europe and the world over, and others that are not uh, highly competitive. The paradox is that Germany is not highly competitive at the very beginning of the euro, as you know, they have a current account deficit. They have real problems to sell their product because, because uh, reunification has uh, uh, driven them very high in terms of uh, wages and salaries. And the unit labor costs are high. The rapport uh, between the uh, quality and the cost of the, uh, the prices uh, 
of the product uh, is not uh, good. Renault is selling uh, a lot of cars in Germany because it's a much better quality price uh, composition. That's the beginning. That's uh, year 2009. No, that's the year, I'm sorry, 99, 98, 99. Uh, France at the same time has a, a current account surplus and uh, has, you know, return to a level of competitiveness that is not yet sufficient, but it's uh, much better than before, but still uh, is uh, a little bit better than ger the German. What happens then until the crisis uh, of 2009-2010? Uh, the unit labor cost in Germany have augmented very, very slowly. The unit labor cost in Greece skyrocketed. The unit labor cost in Portugal went far, in Ireland went very, very far, very rapidly, very high. Now, of course, uh, we could say this is the functioning of the market economy, uh, and it's true that it was the functioning of the market economy. These uh, economies that uh, were um, uh, in a good position at the very beginning, uh, did not see too well that they had to continue to manage themselves very, very correctly. They had all the facilities which were offered by uh, easy financing. That's absolutely true. Uh, money was uh, abundant. Uh, finance was abundant. And they could finance uh, growing deficits, uh, public finance deficit and current account deficit, more and more and more, which, by the way, explains why it is so wrong to think that everything can be solved if the central bank or if the financing of the economy is much more abundant. You can have that and pave the way for the abominable catastrophe that the, the Greek had or uh, the, the Irish had or the Portuguese had. And this were a very terrible catastrophe, as you have said and mentioned. But you can explain, unfortunately, the catastrophe by the policies, de facto policies that were followed before. And by the fact that the Europeans did not respect their own rules. They had the Stability and Growth Pact, which was supposed to discipline precisely, at least the, uh, I would say, public finance part of the economy. And these rules were not respected they should have seen that it was totally unreasonable to let their market share diminish year after year in terms of exports and to let the current account deficit grow and grow and grow up to the level that Greece unfortunately had in 2009-2010, uh, namely 15% of the GDP of current account deficit, 15% of the GDP of public finance deficit. So again, I'm not suggesting that this was only the responsibilities of the uh, countries concerned, individual countries concerned. It's a collective responsibility. The countries concerned were in a universe which was laxist, and they did not realize that they had to be here as properly as possible. Let me give you one example which uh, is, uh, and I, I don't want to quote any particular country, but I will quote two countries that I will call X and Y to demonstrate that it's not, not, only, not only one. X and Y. X and Y augmentations of wages and salaries in the public service from 1st January 99 up to end of 09 end of 09 because it is the start of the uh, sovereign risk crisis. So it, if I'm computing correctly, it's an 11 years uh, uh, period. During these 11 years, the average augmentation of wages and salaries in the civil service for the euro area as a whole has been 36%. For country X, it was an augmentation of 117%. And for country Y, it was an augmentation of 110%, to be compared to 36. So you will tell me, but why are you mentioning the wages and salaries in the public sec in the civil service? 
uh, you should mention wages and salaries, but have unit labor cost, taking also into account the uh, progress of productivity uh, of uh, the private sector. It would be better. And again, I mentioned that because I myself was every month mentioning to the uh, dear friends that were the ministers of finance of the euro area, beware of what's going on. We are going in the wrong direction. Some of you are losing competitiveness at an accelerated pace, and this is a, a recipe for catastrophe. And uh, usually the response I had was, you know, uh, we are not responsible for the functioning of the market economy. Market economy is market economy. Social partners are social partners. They negotiate together. And finally, uh, we have the results uh, that we have to accept. And that's the reason why I decided to produce the level of augmentation in their domain. I was telling them, you are the ministers of finance. You are responsible for wages and salaries in the civil service. It is the civil servant that you are uh, uh, more or less uh, yourself deciding upon. Look at what happens in this domain, because it was only an illustration of a general move in their economies. So I, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but only to tell you that one of the lessons of the crisis is that it is in some way criminal to let things deteriorate and deteriorate, deteriorate year after year when you are in a single currency area where it is absolutely necessary to maintain both, I would say, the Stability and Growth Pact and the monitoring of the competitiveness of the countries concerned, so that their overall competitiveness measures in terms of unit labor cost, taking into account, of course, the productivity progress, would oscillate around the average and not deviate in a, in a persistent fashion from the average, because at the end of the day, you necessarily have a catastrophe. So that, that's something which I think is very, very important. And of course, it is in principle what we have to do now. We have now reinforced the stability and growth pact. We have uh, the MIP, the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, which is uh, a new pillar for uh, monitoring the, uh, I would say, policies of the various countries. And the, M the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure is there precisely to avoid these persistent divergences that we have observed in the past. And of course, we have a number of other points that are also important, like banking union. But uh, I don't elaborate more on that. Let me only say that uh, when uh, one says uh, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and uh, Spain, and, 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 uh, are in a situation where austerity has been uh, dramatic. I agree, of course, that the recovery program has been dramatic in all those countries. But I don't see too well what else was possible in terms of, uh, I would say, overall uh, uh, adjustment of the economy. A, a number of things would have been possible in terms of, being, uh, of introducing much more justice in the adjustment. Because if, if you are minus 15% of the GDP of current account deficits, it means that you are asking the rest of the world to finance you for 15% of the GDP. It's, uh, it's pure arithmetic. If the rest of the world has no confidence in the fact that you will repay, you will not find out any way to finance your 15%. You will find out a way to finance your 15% if you prove that you are going in the right direction and that at a certain moment you won't be at fifth, minus 15 but at zero or something like zero and that you would be able to repay. The only other uh, way to get out of the situation is to find extremely generous people that would be very happy to lose their money. But uh, there is no such generous people after the crisis. Before the crisis, there was a lot of generous people that were uh, very nicely financing the minus 10, minus 11, minus 12, minus 14, 15. But the, the impact of the crisis was that it stopped. And one of the criticisms 
we have vis-à-vis -vis those who financed before the crisis is you were crazy. Why did you finance when you could uh, clearly see that the situation was imbalanced and that uh, you were only paving the way for the future difficulty of the country? And this criticism uh, is uh, very often made. And you cannot say that it is totally unjust, even if it was an expression of uh, absence of lucidity or generosity. So, again, uh, let's go back to the adjustment in the crisis. Very unfortunately, when the system was sufficiently loose and the, na the, the, the nations were sufficiently uh, uh, lacking lucidity, to go up to the situation where you are at minus 10 or minus 15 percent of your current account, you have to accept that you have to go back to a more normal level. And again, as I already said, that more normal level, which is, you know, depending on each country, but it is the level where you can, with some legitimacy, say you can have confidence uh, in this signature because we are back to a more normal situation. You, you have to, never, to augment your competitiveness, to seduce more consumers in your country, in Europe and abroad. So augment competitiveness. And you have to uh, be sure that uh, all taken into account, you are in a situation where, again, you are going back to uh, balance. Uh, that can be said, that can be made in going in the reverse, so saying, telling your own people, we gave you augmentations of X percent, but it was a mistake, we have to get that back. And it's extraordinarily difficult. You know, we have uh, in French uh, uh, a say which says, donner, retenir, ne vaut. When you have given something, to get it back is extraordinarily difficult. So in most cases, what was done, and it is uh, very sad, was to get back a little bit, but not much uh, for those who had a job, and to have a large number of people without job augmenting and augmenting because knocking at the door they could not find out a job. If it would be possible, but again, socially and politically, it's extremely difficult. If it would have been possible to get back to a high level of competitiveness in diminishing the cost, the unit labor cost, uh, drastically, perhaps you could have maintained employment as a high level and you could have adjust. But, but it was practically impossible in most countries. So I mentioned that en passant. And my conclusion is, don't get in such a mess. So let's have you know, a system which cares for uh, avoiding uh, being uh, in a situation where you are so heavily imbalanced that the cost of going back to a normal situation is extremely elevated. And always the cost is to be paid by the most vulnerable segment of the population. But of course, when you are in affluent times, when everything goes, when everything is okay, and where nobody perceives that uh, we are paving the way for great difficulty, uh, you know, the argument is, but why, why uh, adjusting? We are in a nice situation. Uh, I go on very rapidly now. Uh, public, public investment. Public investment uh, is probably something which uh, uh, is uh, uh, a right way to proceed in all advanced economies, not only in Europe, but I think in all advanced economy uh, in the US as well. Still, of course, uh, it is uh, uh, something which has to be decided, it seems to me, uh, mainly by public authorities, namely by governments and parliaments and uh, of course depends on, on the various countries. But they are countries where you could say uh, that uh, they have room for maneuvering or even big room for maneuvering and then they should use the room for maneuvering. Other countries have not big room for maneuvering because they are still in the process of rebalancing their own public finance and we, we know now uh, the price uh, that has to be paid if you are heavily imbalanced.
And uh, I would suggest that uh, it is not, frankly, not the job of the central banks uh, to, um, to deal with that. It is really the job of the governments. The job of the governments is also to pave the way for elevating as much as possible the growth potential of the various economies. The central banks cannot themselves, uh, I would say, uh, uh, be the master of the growth potential of the economies. They have big difference between the various economies. You have economies with a very rapid uh, growth of uh, total factor productivity in the advanced economy. I'm not speaking of the of the emerging economies and countries with very, very low growth of total factor productivity. And you can explain that. You can explain that by a lot of uh, defects uh, of, uh, of some countries in terms of uh, functioning of their markets, uh, in terms of uh, accumulation of rents uh, that, uh, that are preventing uh, newcomers in the various markets. Uh, you have uh, uh, labor market uh, that are functioning extremely poorly uh, in comparison with others. Uh, if you take two countries and you see that in one country there is a very high level of uh, youth unemployment in comparison with the average level, you know that there is a market which is not functioning at all correctly. Because there is no reason why the young people would be at uh, a disadvantage of that dimension. When you see that the level of uh, unemployment in the young part of the population is more or less the same uh, as the average, you know that at least from that standpoint, there is something which uh, functions better than the other country in that particular economy. Uh, and and that, that is a very simple you know, examination. You, you, can, you can see that immediately. And you have a lot of other uh, factors that are playing a, ve a very important role. It's clear that countries that are at the edge of innovation, that are at the edge, uh, the cutting edge of a uh, new economy, uh, are, have a fantastic advantage uh, in comparison with those that are, uh, for many reasons, financial reasons, uh, uh, I would say university reasons, uh, cultural reasons uh, uh, that are uh, not at this cutting edge. And uh, uh, of course, that plays also a very important role. But the central banks have, uh, unfortunately, nothing to play in those domains. Uh, they, they can encourage the governments. They can say, and they say, that uh, this is extremely important and that the uh, elevating the growth potential uh, is something which is absolutely decisive. I don't think that they can substitute to the absence. If you take two countries, one country with, uh, I would say, uh, uh, augmentation of, uh, of uh, productivity in general and labor productivity, which is extremely flattering, and another country wh wh where it is more or less. It was the case more or less of Italy for a very long period of time before the most recent period. And you had absolutely no augmentation of productivity. Uh, so wh what, what can do the central bank in such a situation? If it tried to substitute to the fact that there is no appropriate total factor productivity increase, it will only you know, create, uh, as, I, as uh, all things being equal, more inflation. And creating more inflation will only be an additional levy, an additional taxation of the most vulnerable part of the population to the extent that you agree with me that uh, it is much more difficult to prevent yourself uh, from the uh, taxation of inflation when you are in the most vulnerable part of the population in comparison with the wealthiest and uh, with the most, uh, I would say, uh, easy part of the population. So we have to be very serious on that. Uh, I, I fully agree that the situation and the crisis uh, gave the central banks uh, an additional, I would say, responsibility in our societies. And that, that is really recognized and that is true. But it doesn't mean that they can substitute to uh, governments, parliaments, and as I said, uh, not only governments, parliaments, also uh, university people, uh, also uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, unions. They cannot substitute to what is the society uh, themselves if the societies have uh, and still has important uh, defects in terms of uh, you know, delivering growth and jobs. Uh, 
So I, I think that I mentioned, uh, en passant, the price stability issue. I, I mean, we, we, our conclusion in the G30 work is that price stability remains uh, very important. Uh, and as, as you could see in my uh, exposition, I insisted on the fact that one of the lessons drawn by the central banks during that period was precisely that anchoring solidly in the medium and long run price stability in a period where you had, you had successively threats of uh, deflation, and you still have, and threats of inflation. Uh, I'm very happy in a way with the, period, with the present period because before we had a real threat of deflation or very low inflation, the argument was you are always combating inflation and so forth with your definition of price stability at 2%. And now we see that uh, at least one country uh, and central bank established 2% as a goal to elevate the inflation and not to uh, reduce the level of inflation. So that, that demonstrates that we are symmetric in, in some in our um, in our way of uh, understanding price stability, that it is not uh, uh, only a one way, it's a two way. And uh, we, we uh, are fighting against deflation as well as against inflation. And again, the, it seems to me that uh, this is uh, something uh, of great importance. Uh, Trichet and Draghi. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, first of all, I don't think that uh, there is such a difference between uh, between us, F first of all, we have the same. We had the same uh, governing council, and don't forget that all the decisions are taken by a governing council, and uh, that that is something which uh, which is very important. My my own, uh, you know, thesis is that first of all, I can demonstrate that some decisions which were taken in my time were not easy decisions, and in a way, we are perhaps more dramatic than decisions taken after I left. And I have, uh, you know, an objective <laughs> demonstration. My two German, I don't know whether you have German citizens here. Yes, good. So two, uh, you, you could see that two German citizens that were member of the governing council in my time resigned because they were very hostile to decisions that were taken. And that I took myself, of course, with the approval of a majority of the governing council. So to argue that uh, I was uh, myself extraordinarily orthodox, you will not sell that, it seems to me, to the German public opinion. And I'm, I'm referring to two dramatic moments where I decided that we would have to purchase treasuries of Greece, Ireland, and Portugal in May 2010, when it was never done, of course, by the ECB before, and when I have to say that a large number of observers, certainly in Germany, but also in other countries, were considering that it was not in line with the promise that had been made uh, when we created the EU, namely that we, we are merging the currencies but not touching the budget in any respect. So my own uh, understanding was that uh, we had the right to do it and that I there was monetary policy consideration that would permit us to purchase those treasuries because the crisis had created enormous amount of margins and spreads that was, we are not permitting us to uh, communicate, to, to channel uh, to Greece, Ireland, and Portugal the decisions that were taken at the level of the governing council. Uh, because again, uh, the treasuries and the public signature in those countries uh, were uh, put at a, at a very, very high level in terms of interest rates. And of course, they were still considered in Ireland, in, uh, in Greece, in Portugal, as the best signature because it was the signature of the state. So all the, signa the private signature in those uh, economies were pushed up and up and up and up. And I considered that uh, this was something that was not correct uh, 
taking into account our responsibility uh, to uh, care for the monetary policy to be uh, communicated and uh, channeled uh, to the full euro area. Uh, so, and I did the same and we did the same in the ECB with uh, uh, two countries, uh, mo much more important uh, by the way in terms of dimension, Italy and Spain. In August 2011, uh, I had to purchase uh, uh, treasuries of Italy and Spain for the same reason, because we were in a situation where, again, uh, the monetary policy was not transmitted uh, in, these, uh, in these economies. So you see, these are examples that, uh, for, for, for which I don't buy this idea. And on top of that, in terms of interest rates, in my time, the main issue that we had was to stabilize uh, inflation expectations against tendencies to go up. So the, the, the problem we had was more a problem of uh, uh, anchoring solidly inflation expectations with a threat of inflation, uh, particularly in the, the last period. But at the same time, I had uh, been attached and we are back to one of the issues I, I had no time to address. Uh, I, I was attached to the so-called uh, separation principle. So I considered that the uh, interest rate uh, decisions on the one hand and the non-standard decisions on the other hand were two different things. And that we had to accept that we could uh, you know, take very bold decisions as regards the non-standard decisions, purchasing, uh, for instance, uh, treasuries, as I just said, uh, for uh, uh, five countries, uh, all taken together, or uh, to uh, purchase covered bonds, which uh, I did twice in my time, uh, or to uh, embark on a full allotment, uh, uh, as I explained, uh, uh, very, very boldly, and at the same time to be sure that nobody could challenge our uh, solid anchoring of inflation expectations, and which explains the decisions which were taken as regards interest rates. So, and I don't think that uh, uh, Mario was less involved in the uh, euro area construction than I was. Uh, so uh, again, <laughs> I think that <laughs> there is a number of considerations which I would a little bit challenge. Uh, I will also challenge uh, the Stiglitz mentioning, I don't remember whether it was by you or not, because uh, Stiglitz didn't go to the IMF. He was the chief economist of the World Bank. World Bank. And he criticized the IMF <laughs> quite vehemently, but he was at the World Bank. But, but that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, diminish uh, your remark, I mean, uh, the, uh, but it's a, it's a fact. Uh, I fully agree with the remarks which were made on the uh, modeling that we had before the crisis. And I said myself, publicly at the time it was noted that I had, uh, I think I, m I mentioned that, there. I, I th I, uh, we were abandoned by, by our conventional tools. Yes, I, 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 uh, I made that public in 2010. Uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, the, the traditional, the, the uh, uh, I would say, general equilibrium stochastic uh, models uh, proved in the crisis to be very bad. That, that does not mean that they were, they are always very bad, but that means that they are making implicit uh, working assumptions that uh, are to be looked at very, very, very carefully. And uh, particularly, I have to say, in uh, the circumstances following immediately the uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, I can tell you during three quarters, all our models, and I'm speaking of all our models, uh, not, not to be particularly uh, dramatically against uh, the uh, DGSA, uh, DGSE, uh, but, but also uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, other kind of, I would say, uh, learn, uh, trying to summarize all the information we were getting uh, and to have some kind of projections, all were wrong to, the, uh, to an extent which is hard to believe. Uh, during three quarters, what we had uh, for the, uh, I would say, growth of the quarters, of the present quarters and of the next quarter, done by all uh, national central banks and by the ECB and by the private sector, were totally out of what we were observing ex post, namely that the real economy was plunging and uh, falling like a stone much more rapidly than what was foreseen. So it, it was clearly a, a lesson uh, so hard that I considered that I cannot trust, I could not trust any of these projections and that the only thing, the only, uh, I would say, anecdotes I could trust were the uh, anecdotes given by the real economy uh, responsible, namely by the CEOs of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the big business uh, in, uh, at the global level and at the level of the, of the euro area and of, the, of Europe as a whole. Uh, and they, they could see things that the economist could not and they could project themselves in a way which was very unfortunately in this period, it's not true in all period, but in this period of uh, ab absolute, uh, uh, I would say, contagion of crisis, it is something which is grave. So you will tell me, but w what works? And my sentiment, uh, nothing works uh, right now, frankly speaking. Uh, we, we have to continue working very, very hard in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, economist uh, work. It's re real science is at stake. Uh, the, the things that seems to me the most promising are more or less all those who are based on analogy with physics analogy with physics where you have a very large number of entities that are very closely interconnected and where you can have phenomena that the economist had never captured until now but I could see in the crisis things like phase transition you know uh, in the 9th of August 2007 I could see that in one day or two days, the uh, risk premia that were in the money market in Europe and in the rest of the advanced economy was changing from zero to 30 basis point or something like that in, say, overnight, in one day. And that is a phenomenon that you cannot replicate, in, to my knowledge, in any of the models that were existing at the time. Again, when you see that Lehman Brothers, I already mentioned that Lehman Brothers collapse could change quasi overnight the behavior of all decision makers in public, in uh, private finance, the, in the advanced economy, because the reasoning was very simple. If Lehman Brothers can collapse, it is that a major institutions can collapse. I thought that after a burst turn, it was impossible for a major institution to collapse. And also, by the way, after uh, the rescue of uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in the US. So if it is the case, then we are in a situation where everybody can collapse. So I have to beware of all my counterparts. Uh, and if I have to be aware of all my counterparts, what shall I do? I shall realize as soon as possible all my money, avoid any risk, be as short term and liquid as possible, and uh, wait for better time. And that was the reasoning simultaneously uh, of all decision makers. Uh, of course, it took, it took a little time because some of these decisions were taken overnight. Others, uh, 
you had to wait for one week because the, such decisions were taken uh, to, to realize all your uh, long-term investment or medium-term investment had to be decided uh, every week. Others were decided every month. So you, you see, it took a little time to generalize. But the change of mood was instantaneous. And that is also something that you can have replicated in some uh, models that are inspired by physics but that you had uh, no, you were not aware of, of the fact that we had, it is part of what I call the emerging property of the new world in which we are. And uh, this is absolutely fascinating, of course. And again, it's work in progress, but still work in progress, not surprisingly, uh, again. It's also amazing to see that you are a young economist and you are starting uh, more or less your meditation and your reflection uh, at a time which is particularly stimulating, obviously, because you have new areas where, which are unexplored. And uh, in a way, you are more or less in the situation of uh, the cosmologists, for instance, <laughs> that are just discovering that uh, uh, the universe is accelerating and accelerating. And this is something which is entirely new and call for uh, a lot of meditation. You have the chance to be in a time of um, intense new meditation. So that was, uh, so heterodox school, I, I, I don't know too well what means heterodox school. Uh, it's, it's clear that for me, Minsky is more important than many, many, many other uh, big names. That's clear. Uh, and that uh, it seems that Irving Fisher did also a lot of very right things that were forgotten. I'm not sure that you would, you would qualify Irving Fisher of heterodox. <laughs> it would not be my tendency. Uh, it's, uh, it's clear that um, Keynes uh, has said everything himself. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, he, he remains a fundamental icon, uh, of course, uh, in terms of, uh, of intelligence and uh, lucidity. But uh, having a naive interpretation of Keynes would be also very dangerous. So uh, yeah, I, I think we have to be, to be prudent there. Uh, Marx, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Marx as an economist, I <laughs> would be very cautious. Uh, he's a ve he was probably a very, very good thinker in general, uh, certainly a philosopher of first magnitude. Uh, I would, you know, he was himself very inspired by, uh, by uh, the uh, British uh, economists, and I'm, I'm not sure that you can really th see things that are very useful in, the, in our present uh, situation. But we have to, to work a lot. The, all the meditation of uh, post-Schumpeterian, it, it might not be considered very heterodox, uh, Schumpeter, but we are in a Schumpeterian uh, environment. I mean, when, when you go in the Silicon Valley or in, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, small startups, uh, uh, nurseries uh, everywhere in the world, and when you realize that this is done on a global level, I, I was absolutely amazed myself in surprising some conversation in Paris where the guys were discussing that because they, were, they had a network uh, with Japan, the US, even China on board for uh, doing uh, dirty things <laughs> as regards uh, uh, new uh, bits, uh, you know, those currencies uh, that uh, I consider very, very dangerous personally. But I was absolutely amazed because e even Schumpeter could not imagine that innovation and creativity could be fully globalized at a level of extraordinary imaginative young persons uh, that were uh, directly connected uh, the world over. So uh, some meditation uh, along the Schumpeter are very stimulating. We did not speak, and I did not, and you did not speak of uh, uh, the theory of uh, secular stagnation, and I don't buy that myself, I have to say. Ah, okay, okay, so you, you will have certainly a very, very interesting discussion there. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to buy that at a time where innovation, creativity is such, and where I have the feeling that we are totally under-assessing the, uh, I would say, consumer surplus that we have with all the new tools. I, I know myself 
that I have an incredible consumer surplus, for instance, when I want to check whether something I say in English is idiomatic or not, uh, when, of course, I, I, uh, I'm not sure because I'm not an English-born uh, speaker, uh, then I can check that immediately there. Uh, if I had to go to a person <laughs> competent in English to uh, tell me, and if I had to pay for that service, you know, which, which is a service I have immediately because I go back and forth uh, in an automatic translation, and this is for free, I don't pay anything for that. So it's a, it's a small example, but it seems to me that we are probably underestimating. You know, and it seems to me that it, it might be interesting in terms of... Uh, of um, research, economic research, to see exactly whether we are not underestimating growth, whether we are not underestimating um, uh, productivity progress, uh, because of our difficulty to assess exactly what is going on in IT and in the new services that are associated with IT. Uh, one thing is sure, we know what is unemployment. And all this will drive me to considering that it's not growth necessarily that is our major problem. And I, g I go back to some things that you said. It's not necessarily growth. It's be because maybe we are under assessing growth. It's not necessarily, m myself I said we have to elevate the growth potential and so forth. We have to elevate the job creation. We have to go by the appropriate means to full employment. And, and that is our main goal. Would you mind to take ten more, ten, ten more minutes to take a few questions for the, oh yeah. the audience? Oh, yeah. It's already five. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, really uh, no, 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 OK, OK. Of course, of course, of course. Of course. Of course. One round only. OK, if you, some of you have some question, could maybe we, can, we could try to be concise. All, all the questions have already been asked. <laughs> okay, so Daniela? Okay, so um, two questions. The first question is when you talked about the deficit countries, I was thinking why would they be forced to adjust and why wouldn't the surplus country also uh, be adjusting? For example, the Germans, uh, they had an incredible surplus and they got this incredible surplus partly because of their industrial strategy, but also because of their bigger their neighbors' policy. So why w wouldn't we ask to the surplus country also to adjust? And my other question was about central bank independence. Uh, I've never been convinced by the current arguments in the debates uh, for central bank independence, but probably the arguments you made are much more better. But on the other hand, you also said that um, central banks now are getting more and more involved in fiscal policies. They give policy recommendations to the governments. And um, it's very consistent uh, because we need a policy mix that is consistent, uh, which is not the case currently in Europe, in my view. Uh, but if they can give advices in terms of fiscal policies, uh, wouldn't that mean that the independence should be more tempered? Uh, for example, shouldn't the ECB uh, be accountable in front of Euro European Parliament. I know there is a report, but shouldn't uh, the European Parliament vote on that report, be able to change the committee if the Parliament is not happy about the policy implemented? These are much, uh, I have more questions, but we only have 10 minutes. I would like the students also to ask questions. Okay, there is a few questions. Hi, my, my name is uh, Joe and I come from Argentina and you were talking about Latin American countries and I didn't have the experience of the hyperinflation in Argentina but my parents always told me that how they have to dip in the supermarket to get the, the, the cheapest prices because they were not marked yet and it was like a, a really crazy situation so I agree on 
uh, on how problematic it's the uh, hyperinflation, but uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit the more normal rates of inflation, because, for example, in Argentina, in the in the past, well, in the decade from the 90s to to the new century, we have actually a zero a zero rate of inflation. But, for example, the unemployment was, when we end the decade, really, really high. And in, uh, in comparison, the last decade, we had uh, a higher rate of inflation, but the unemployment was much lower. But not, not only the case of Argentina, because I recognize it's a s strange country, but I was looking here uh, on the internet the, the rate of inflation of different Latin American countries, and most of them are between 5 and 10%, and 10 percent. And for example, this last decade has been one of the, the biggest growth for many Latin American countries. So uh, for me, uh, thinking about uh, the uh, more poor people, for example, it's, may, it's maybe better to have a job with a little bit of, on, of inflation rather to directly not having a job. So I was thinking on, on, on this uh, relation between inflation and growth and, and poverty. Uh, hi, I have uh, two questions uh, that are completely unrelated. Um, the first question is uh, relates a little bit to Professor Lang's question. Um, what is your assessment of the role of the ECB in the Troika? Uh, when we talk about um, central bank independence and separation of monetary policy and fiscal policy, do you think that maybe the ECB also overstretched its mandate when it participated in the Troika? And uh, the second completely different question is about uh, your assessment of the negative uh, deposit rates that the ECB uh, has now set. W do you think uh, those are effective tools or I don't know do you do you believe that it won't help much thanks okay <laughs> okay so uh, this is the last batch of questions uh, <laughs> after you free me <laughs> right I didn't re realize that uh, time had elapsed <laughs> so much so um, Perhaps I, I take the question in, in the order um, where they were asked. Uh, so, um, deficit countries, surplus countries. Um, first of all, uh, very unfortunately, uh, there was an asymmetry between uh, the deficit countries and the surplus countries. Nobody was uh, refusing to uh, finance, of course, the surplus countries. And we had, in the crisis, this absolute drama where Nobody wanted to finance Greece. Over, uh, it, was, it was not done overnight. It took a little time. But it was the consequence of the worst crisis ever since World War II in the advanced economy. And as I said, the, the, crisis, uh, the, the, the financial crisis morphed from a private crisis to a public crisis. And at that moment, those uh, signatures, which unfortunately were considered the most vulnerable, the worst signature of the world, were uh, uh, hit in a, in a fashion which was dramatic. So it was not a choice, it was an absolute obligation to get out of, of the mess. But I fully agree with you that inside Europe there is a case, of course, and it is the case in the MIP theory, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, to consider that you can be in imbalances if you have too big a surplus, and not, uh, p particularly a current account surplus, uh, exactly as you have too big a current account deficit. Again, the risk that uh, you are taking when you are a surplus are different from the risk you are taking when you are a deficit, and you have to know that because it's part of the real world. Uh, but uh, that the governance of Europe should tell a country which is posting 8% of the GDP of current account surplus or 10% of the GDP of current account surplus, which is the case, if I'm not misled, of Germany and the Netherlands, that this governance, this central governance would say, well, yeah, there is something which does not function correctly in your economy. 
taking into account everything, including, of course, uh, your uh, own present level of, uh, of uh, external finance, uh, taking into account demographics. Uh, you could uh, be uh, certainly, uh, uh, I would say, eligible to a 5% or a 4% surplus of current account. But uh, much more than that is not reasonable. And it might be because your uh, political, uh, uh, your, your, your economic policy is not optimal in terms of uh, uh, reglage, both uh, in terms of uh, structural policies and of uh, fiscal policies. It might also be that your social partners are uh, behaving in a way which uh, is hard to uh, fully understand and perhaps you could help a little bit. And it is exactly what Germany does. When Germany introduces uh, a minimum wages and salary requirement which did not exist before, when the uh, head of the Bundesbank says perhaps uh, we could have wages and salaries negotiation that would be uh, more uh, forthcoming and uh, more dynamic, we are in a situation where, uh, you know, something is said that goes in the direction of diminishing this surplus contract. But again, now we have a new pillar for governance, which is called the MIP, and which normally should play a role in this domain. Now, I draw your attention, uh, Mr. Professor, <laughs> on the fact that there is a mistake which is usually done by some in my own country, in, your, in our own country, which is to consider the euro area as a closed shop, as if it was itself a closed economy. It's not a closed economy, of course. If one country in Europe is very competitive, it, is also, it, it sends to China, for instance, it also helps. And it is absolutely untrue to say that all what Germany is selling to China is taken out of the potential of the other countries, uh, say of France or Italy. So it's, it's much, much more complex uh, to, to uh, judge perfectly the symmetry between deficit and surplus countries if, and of you know, lack of competitiveness and excess of competitiveness if you open up uh, the uh, euro area economy, which is the largest open economy of the world, and at least of comparable economies in the world. We are much more open than the US and much more open than Japan. And we have to be fully aware of that. Uh, second question, uh, the sentiment that we are better served by independent central bank came progressively uh, and in the experience, I have to say, of uh, uh, stagflation. And the fact that finally uh, the uh, banks that, and the countries that seem to have gone through this period in a better fashion than others were only a few, including Switzerland and the Swiss National Bank and Germany and the Bundesbank. And that, that is an observation that was made in the case. And progressively, the idea that uh, having uh, independence uh, would progressively help. It became a global, I would say, uh, consensus. We have the experience of the crisis. And I have to say that in this dramatic stress test, I didn't see a real move against the independence of the central banks. I would say in some respect, I, I made an argument myself which goes in the direction of independence, which is highly paradoxical because nobody would have thought that you could reason like that. Uh, as regards the US, it is true that the US Fed has been attacked politically mainly, I would say, by the uh, right wing of the Republican Party, on the ground that it had been perhaps too unorthodox, too bold, too bold and swift in its decision. But uh, again, it's a minority, and it is a kind of criticism that would, on the contrary, perhaps, make an argument for, to reinforce independence.
to be to be sure that uh, we we have uh, uh, we are really protecting medium and long term stability uh, against both i would say deflation and drama and dramatic crisis and also of course inflation uh, the question on Latin America, I, if you compare, you compare Latin America between uh, countries in Latin America, uh, compare with Asian countries, compare the success of Latin American countries with the success of Asian countries during the same period. I have a lot of Latin America friends, of course. And by the way, I was myself president of the Paris Club when we rescheduled uh, Argentina. I, I went uh, last number of time in Buenos Aires and uh, in this very difficult period of time. Uh, we, uh, we have, I mean, I'm simplifying, but the success of the Asian countries is not to be compared. And uh, I'm not sure that when I take everything into account, uh, it is not partly because the uh, management of Asian countries has been all taken into account over the long time, the long period of time, uh, more sound and reasonable and with a level of inflation which would be inferior. So you, you yourself are more or less back to the Phillips curves uh, interpreted uh, quite naively. It's very simple. We are make an arbitrage between inflation and jobs. And if we have more inflation, uh, we will have more jobs and uh, everything is OK. Uh, it's not the way I think uh, experience has demonstrated that it was really working. Uh, but uh, again, it doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we do not have to work much more on jobs and job creation uh, and uh, less, perhaps, a little less, as I said already, on, on pure growth. Uh, because, because, after all, the cohesion of the society is entirely based on everybody having a job. And th that is absolutely fundamental, particularly the young people. Uh, ECB in the Troika. The ECB didn't ask to be in the Troika. The other partners asked the ECB to be in the Troika. Uh, I accepted uh, that we would be in the Troika at the request of the governments because I have to say the, the level of confidence that uh, the governments and the Europe as a whole had in the central bank was considerable. And uh, you know, in, in a number of cases, they were asking us to make our point to, uh, to confirm that it was very important to do this or to do that because there was a systemic aspect uh, in, for instance, the Greek problems and so forth. So again, it was not at all the will of the, of the ECB. Uh, we were very, very keen to say that in any case, we were not ourselves part of the negotiation. We were an observer in the Troika, but we were not giving money uh, as uh, the IMF was doing. We were not giving money as the government of Europe were doing through the EFSF or the ESM. And so we, we, we were in a very special position of observers. And I think that this, uh, this case has been made very clearly. When you are in such a situation where the Troika highly unfortunately had to say things that are not agreeable, uh, it's not, I mean, the IMF was the bad guy the world over because it, it, when countries uh, were in difficulty, it had to say, well, we are very sorry, but you have to adjust. And uh, that, that is not agreeable to hear uh, by anybody, uh, even by you. <laughs> you don't like too much people that are saying, you're very sorry, but you have to adjust now. Uh, and I can see that in your remark, and I understand that. Uh, so, but, but again, the, the, IMF, the um, IMF was a full partner. The Commission was a full partner. Both were reporting to decision-making bodies that were the uh, board of directors of the IMF and the European uh, uh, Eurogroup uh, for the Commission. Uh, and we ourselves were observers. Uh, negative interest rates. Uh, as you know, we, we are exploring extraordinary uh, new ways uh, we have uh, uh, Sweden, 
if I'm not misled, at minus 0.75%. And uh, we have Switzerland as, at minus 0.75%. Has to be recheck. <laughs> I, I ask you to recheck. Uh, and even in the case of, uh, of uh, Switzerland, it seems to me that it is a real interest rate. It's not the deposit rate that you pay to banks when they put their money back uh, to the central bank. So we, we are in a very, very strange world, obviously. And uh, I have to, to say that in any case, it cannot be too negative because uh, then everybody would, would keep the notes and uh, you, you will have your notes and uh, you will keep to your notes and then you have no negative interest rates on your notes. So uh, th there are limits of course to the negative interest rates but it, it proves something which I would like to make as, a, as my last point perhaps uh, if I may. Uh, I two, two last points. Two last points. One is the uh, argument that you made, Madame, uh, referring to uh, some analysis that we were in Europe in a special case where there was no national central bank to help uh, countries that uh, would be uh, in real difficulty. Uh, first of all, I prove myself that we could intervene when it was legitimate, in my opinion, uh, uh, in terms of monetary policy. And so it's a part of the argument uh, is, uh, seems to me to be counted. Another element which is important, in the present period of QE in Europe, as you know, the QE most of the QE is made at the risk of the national central bank, not at the risk of the system with a system sharing risk. The system sharing risk must be 8% if I'm not misled, has to be rechecked also. But um, uh, most of the QE intervention is uh, made at the risk of the central bank. So in a way, you see, the argument is uh, weakened also by this uh, remark. But you mentioned, we mentioned the IMF. I was myself president of the Paris Club. At the time, we had 52 countries in the world that were in an absolute dramatic situation with adjustment driven by the IMF that were extremely difficult. And those in Latin America know that because all Latin America countries had to go through these adjustments, apart from Colombia, which was the only country not embarking in default, <coughs> debt renegotiation, and IMF standby. They all had their own central banks. The idea that if you have your own central bank, you are in a situation which is fantastic, is a fantasy that had been invented by some that do not like too much the uh, euro area, or the euro, or the ECB, or whatever, and you name it, or politically are putting themselves in another, I would say, sensitivity. Or, uh, but let, let's be very clear. We have a lot of experience of countries put in a very difficult situation with a fully independent central bank. If you think that you get out of the mess only in printing your own currency uh, eternally, no. And even the UK has been in the IMF at a certain moment uh, after uh, World War II. So, so we, we have to be more cautious on that. That was my first remark. And my second remark, my second remark, <laughs> is, uh, again, that, that we, we have a lot of hard work to do as economists. And you have a lot of hard work to do as economists. Because as you could see during our conversation, there are very, very, uh, a very large number of dimension. 
which we have to understand much better, labor market and what shall be done to emulate uh, in all countries what has been apparently successful in some. But we, we have to fully understand this, uh, this uh, particular aspect of economics because, because uh, in my opinion, we, we, we are not sufficiently... I mean, if we had a large deal of consensus on that, perhaps a large number of difficulty would be overcome much more uh, rapidly. We have to find out the new modeling that would take care of this except exceptional situation, take care of the crisis emerging, take care of the contagion as we are observing it, take care of future risk, and, and this is uh, largely unexplored. We have to explore uh, the uh, impact of IT and of all the services associated with IT, with the new emerging properties of, the glo of global finance and the global economy, but also uh, we have to uh, understand much better exactly what is growth today and what is pro what are productivity uh, progress today, what are the TFP today. In my opinion, there are a, a, a number of research that are going on, but they are not, uh, I would say, convincing yet. And still a number of people, and I'm, I'm part of this constituency, are convinced that we are presently under assessing growth and uh, that we are presently under assessing uh, total factor productivity progress. And, and, and so I could continue for a very long period of time. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>